Hi, this is Christopher Muller, designer of Burning Banners from Compass Games. Um, I'm going to spend a little time today uh, walking you through the basic game. I'm going to play uh, the Invasion of Dreyfeld. That's the introductory scenario that comes with the game. Um, we suggest that uh, when you're starting the game that that be your, the first scenario that you play. While the basic game is meant to introduce new players to the game, it's also uh, a fun way to play the game if you want uh, to spend a little less time or you're introducing some new players to the game. Um, it's meant as a legitimate uh, form of play. The advanced game, which I'm going to um, discuss in another video, includes magic cards, monsters, treasure, uh, bunches of cool stuff. But this video will give you the core mechanics, uh, show you how the game works, and then when you've got that all down, uh, check out the advanced video. The, the game comes with four maps that fit together like this. Um, Broken Coast, uh, the Wildlands, Fields of Ash, and over here is the Imperial Heartland. Um, you're not going to use all of the maps for all of the scenarios. If you're playing solitaire and you don't have a lot, a lot of space, you can play you can play a game that just has a small footprint and there's lots of variety there. If you want to play the whole giant thing, you can do that too. So lots of lots of opportunities to try different things. So the introductory the introductory scenario. Um, this just shows you up here that. Um, you're going to use one map, just the Wildlands. That's this map right here. So all the, all the scenarios are divided into two sides. There's an invader and a resistance. And if you look, they vary by scenario. So they're all, they'll all show you, you know, who's involved. There's, some of them are more involved than others. There's more, like here, there's, there's four kingdoms on each, two kingdoms on each side. They play as teams. Um, you can have one player play more than one kingdom. Uh, in this one, there's just one kingdom on each side. This is Fjordland is that symbol. They're kind of like uh, Vikings, Norsemen. And then these are the dwarves, the Oathborn. Um, the, so all of the information that you need for a, uh, each scenario is on one of these, one of these displays. Um, and there's a, whole, you know, there's a whole book full of them. So here it shows you what the Oathborn, what their setup is. They have a starting income of two. I'll explain that in a minute. They they get six gold to build at the beginning, and they will have one control one of their control markers in the town of Shaded Vale, which is right here. That's Shaded Vale. Um, Fjordland has a starting income of four, has fifteen gold opening builds, and has two control markers: one in Norstead and one in Far Tumed. Here's Far Tumed. Here's Norstead. Barless on the lake down here is one of their um, uh, loyal settlements, it's called. It has this symbol on it that the Fjordland symbol means that's their settlement. Um, and Zarenbar is an Oathborn settlement. That's their settlement. Um, let's see. We have some special rules. This just says the only settlements that can be attacked or occupied are Fort Garad, which is this uh, settlement right here. That's neutral. Nobody controls that. The Oathborn control, control those two settlements that I discussed in the beginning, and Fjordland controls these three settlements. Um, and the victory conditions are, at the end of the autumn season, the player who controls the most settlements wins. In the case of a tie, the Oathborn player wins. So the Oathborn player is the defender in this. Oh, and up here is duration. Uh, tells you how long the scenario is. This one is three turns. It starts in year one in the spring and ends year one in the autumn. So that's going to be three turns. Each turn is a season in this game, really. Or there's seasons, and then there's turns within a season. So the, you're going to have the season track. Comes with the game. And you're going to track the seasons up here. So we're going to start with year one in the spring. Uh, you put a marker here, which is the current turn. The autumn will have another marker, which is the end of the campaign. And then down here, you'll have um, the Oathborn here, and the uh, Fjordland have a marker here. And then They'll conduct their turn, move their marker down to turn complete. Then Fjordland will go, move its marker down to turn complete, and then the season will go to the next one. I'll show you how that works. So we're going to start in the spring. We're going to end in the autumn. Um, you're not going to use 
Any of these book symbols in the basic game, that's for the advanced game. You're going to use the income track here. The revolt track on the end, you're not going to use unless the empire is involved, which they're not. The instructions tell you what the turn order is. Whoops. Right here. So, turn order is the Oathborn's going to go first, followed by the Fjordland. And you can have up to six kingdoms. This just shows that these four kingdoms are not active in this scenario. So, we're not, they're not even in the game. So, this is going to go here, the Oathborn. This is going to go here, Fjordland. Uh, we do need the income for each. So the, uh, the Oathborn have two, right there. And Fjordland has four. This is the amount of gold that that kingdom is going to get um, at the beginning of, it, of each of its turns, during its income step. Uh, and then control markers. So Fjordland has a bunch of armies. Uh, and other markers. These are their control markers. So they have two control markers, one in Norstead and one in Far Tumed. And then, uh, then the rest of their counters go on this play mat. So each kingdom has a play mat. Um, it's going to show you the number types of units. Um, it's a way to organize, uh, organize your stuff. Over here is for the advanced game. You just don't worry about that. Uh, if there's any special rules, which there are a few, those go right here. Um, that's Fjordland, and this is the for the Oathborn. Oops, there's their play mat. Again, you can ignore the advanced game stuff, and you're just looking at these. The, ba the basic game, not the advanced game. All right. Uh, so, when you're setting up, you just... So, for the basic game, you take all the heroes. That's these guys. They look like this. Uh, they all get put back in the box, and these little monster counters also are not used in the basic game. Uh, control markers, you put all those. Those are going to go here. You won't need a, a ton of them for this scenario. So, there's all the heroes are gone, so we don't need them. So these guys, we're going to put uh, on their spaces. So, if you look, armies, and this is an army, this is a draken army. He's a, he's a flying dragon guy. This is his full strength side, and this is his weakened side. So it has this red, sort of torn banner looking thing. That means he's weakened, um, and if he takes another hit, he dies. So they start full strength, they flip to weaken when they take a hit, and then they are eliminated. So uh, they, you set them up on your map with their full strength side up. This number up here, uh, you can't really see it easily, but it's an 8. That 8 is the cost to build this unit. Um, so you want to be able to see that. So that's going to go, you can put him in his space, uh, a bunch of freeholders here. All right, so we have both, uh, we have both kingdoms set up. This goes in Shaded Vale. The dwarves have that. So you can see, uh, none of these settlements up here are um, in play. We're essentially just playing on half of a map. You have dice. You've got two different kinds of dice. You have heavy dice, which are the black eight-sided dice. Whoop, where are we? And you have light dice, which are the white six-sided dice. Um, these you're going to roll um, for during combat, primarily, and you're always looking, in this game, you're always looking for a five or higher. A five or higher is a success, a four or less is a failure, um, and obviously an eight-sider is much more likely to roll a success than a six-sider. Um, so that's why they're heavy and light. So uh, this is the more powerful dice in combat, this is the weaker dice in combat. Um, and if you look at your units, you'll see, here look at two different units, here's, there you go. All right, so the Iron Legion, if you look, he has two black pips, one white pip, and this ranger from Fjordland has two white pips. What that means is, as you might expect, this is he will roll two light dice in combat, he will roll two heavy and one light dice in combat, so heavy unit and a fairly light unit. Um, also, we might as well talk about this now, uh, some units will have a symbol down here, and that symbol is called an ability, in this case ranged, that um, 
because they have their archers, they're ranged. Um, I'll explain that when we get into combat, but that, that'll affect how combat is resolved. This is the movement factor. So the dwarves, very slow, heavy unit, moves two hexes. They have two movement points, and the ranger can move up to four hexes uh, during its turn. Hexes are these spaces on the map. Uh, this number in the diamond, as I talked about before, is the cost. These Both of these units cost the same, uh, but you can see their stats are quite different. Um, all the units are, are basically laid out like that. They'll have a combat rating. These are armies, by the way. All the units that we have in the basic game are armies. Um, the Oathborns start with six gold, five and a one. And the Fjordland starts with 15 gold, so we'll give them... So there, that's their, that's their starting starting builds. So uh, in the rules, so we give them their gold. This is their starting gold. Uh, if we look in the campaign book, it says um, the boop, boop, the Oathborn set up first, Fjordland sets up second. Okay, so <coughs> um, the Oathborn are going to set up first. So what does that mean by setting up? Well, first of all, we put the control markers on the map. The Oathborn, so the Oathborn can now spend their gold to uh, build units. Now, buildings, you can only have one army in a hex at a time. You can't have two, just one. Um, so, uh, building, you can build in a settlement that you control. So the dwarves control two, so you can, you can build in a settlement like that. Or you can build adjacent to a settlement that you control which is important because stacking can be an issue. So at the beginning of the game, you can build in or adjacent to your settlements. Um, and each of those costs. So these two miners here, I'm going to build two miners, and I will I'll describe why I want to build two miners in a moment. Um, that's going to cost me two of my gold. So I have six. I'm going to spend two of them. Now I'm down to four left. Uh, four left, I could build an Iron Legion, and I'll build it in Zarnbar. So there. So those are my builds. So that's that's my whole six, That because co that guy cost four. So four, five, six. I spent my six dollars. So that's set up. The, the Oathborn are now set up. So now it's Fjordland's turn. Fjordland has fifteen dollars. They are very rich. Um, so they can build... In Barless on the Lake, that one's in play, and also these two. These uh, hexes here with the red uh, hex sides around them, those are layers. You cannot enter those hexes at any time. Um, these with the gray, that's a settlement. You can go there. Um, these yellow, it's kind of hard to see here, but these are mines with these little um, crossed symbols. Those are... Anybody can go through there. They don't really mean anything except that miners can go in there and get gold by mining. Uh, that's unique to them. No other kingdom can do that. Uh, so uh, Fjordland, uh, they're going to buy one, two, three sea reavers who are uh, pretty powerful but slow. But that's nine. That leaves me with six more. Uh, we'll get a ranger for four of that and a freeholder for two of that. So that's everything. That's everything. That, that's all their gold. And now they can set these guys up. Uh, they will set up a sea reaver here. I'm sorry, here in, in um, Barless on the Lake. They will set one up right here next to Zarenbar. Um, and they're going to go second, so that's something to consider for them. So they want to protect their settlements there. Uh, we'll put a freeholder in Norstead to hold that, and a ranger adjacent to here. All right, so we've set up. Um, that's basically what set up in, consists of. It's just... In the order listed, you, you set up the season track, and then in the order listed on the in the campaign, you build your starting forces, place them on the map in the order indicated, and then you go on to the first turn. Season. 
So season one, we are in the spring, what year is this, of 565. Uh, bef this is well before the, the War of the Burning Banners, this uh, invasion of Dreyfeld. These guys are actually allies once the, once the big war starts. Uh, but this is early on, and this is a border squabble between uh, one of the Jarls of the Fjordland and a, uh, a Dwarven kingdom here. The Oath one go first. So we're going to go to the sequence of play, and we're going to look at what happens when. So here's the turn sequence. Again, th this is going to be amended somewhat. Uh, the, the text that's in red down there, that's for the advanced game. You just ignore that when you're playing the basic game. So we're going to start with an income phase, which has an income action step. Uh, neither of our kingdoms have really anything that happens there. Um, you know, some of them do. Some kingdoms do. They have certain things they do during the income action step. We don't have that. Then there's just the income step. You're going to gain gold equal to your income level, which we established on that track over there at the beginning of the game. It can go up and go down depending on if you lose or conquer settlements. That, that increases or decreases your income. Um, so you're going to get your money, and then during the activation phase, here you go. Units, in, the, in our case, only armies. Units may be built or activate one at a time. Uh, and you just keep, you do that until the end of the turn. Uh, you can build units, just like we did during setup. Um, and you can and you can activate to move and then do an action. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so the Oath One have two gold. That's their income. So they're going to get two gold. So here's their two. Give that to them. Now they can begin. That's the income step. Now they can go to the activation step and begin doing their activations. So we have these miners down here are going to go over to the endless paths. Now the miners have a special, the Oathborn have a special ability called mountaineering, which allows them to go through mountains at no extra cost. And I'll go through. The, let's go through the extra. Let's go through the terrain real quick for moving. So, uh, if you remember, I said that these numbers here down at the bottom right. That's their movement rating. Miners can move two. Basically, most dwarves, almost all dwarves, I think, can move two. Uh, most dwarves can move two. Um, rangers can move four. The sea reavers here that they, that the fjordland got, they can move two, and these fjordland, uh, freeholders can move three. Um, it costs one to enter a hex, any hex, clear hex, plains it's called. It costs an additional hex to enter a wilderness hex, which is a mountain, or a forest, or a marsh, one of these, marsh hexes. Those are the three wilderness types. If you go, if you enter one of those, it costs you an extra movement point. If you don't have enough movement points to get in there, you can't go in. Um, rivers, there's two types of rivers. There's major rivers, and there's just regular old rivers. Um, they all, well, a river costs you an extra movement point to cross it. So it's a hex side. So this hex side is the river hex side. So to cross that river to get into this hex will cost you one for the river and another one for the mountain. So one, two, three to get in there. That's a tough one. That's a, that's some tough terrain. Um, to cross this river, a major river with this dark outline costs two additional. So this would cost you one two, three as well, just to get across the Shar River. Um, anywhere that there's a bridge or a ford or you'll see a, these roads cross, uh, bri they cross, cross um, rivers, they go through, uh, up here it's pretty open, but they can go through the mountains um, and like here they're going through the mountains. If you're following a road, so if you go from this hex to this hex to this hex to this hex, you're following the road, and no matter what the other terrain in the hex is, as long as you're following that road when you're moving, that costs one to move. You get an additional little bonus. If you spend all your movement on the road, you get an extra movement point. So a dwarf that could normally move two, if he went one, two, he could go three as long as he stayed on the road. But he could not go one, two, and three if he goes off the road. Then he's limited to two. So stay on the road, get an extra movement point. That's your bonus. And roads also negate and bridges negate uh, the penalty. So to cross the river here costs nothing additional because there's a bridge there uh, and the road crosses the river at that point. Um, 
So that's it for terrain and movement. Um, you can't go in the ocean except by using, or in these sea areas, except by using a special ship move, it's called. Um, and I will get into a ship move when we get to that. Um, so units can move and then they can perform an action. Uh, you can't um, you can't do it in, in any other order. You can't do an action and then move. You can't do a part move, perform an action, move some more. Um, it's move action. And once you perform your action, that unit is finished. And he's going to get uh, tipped to the side, canted, we call it. So this is finished. And here he's ready. So at the beginning of your turn, so let's say these guys were finished from last turn, they would become ready. So they're all ready to go. So I'm going to start with this miner. He's going to move one, two. Now normally it would cost an extra moving point to move into the mountains, but the dwarves have that special power, mountaineering. They can go into the mountains for no extra cost. So he's going to go one, two, and then his action, and if you look on here, uh, actions, uh, these are the actions you can do. You can do an attack. You can pass, just skip it. You can perform a ship move, which I talked about, and I'll go into a little more. You can recover. So if a unit is flipped over to its weakened side, remember with the red on the back, this lets them flip back to full strength. Uh, that's your action. Or you can work a mine, oathborn only. So he's going to work the mine. So he does the work the mine action, and he will get one gold, contribute one gold to his kingdom. So now the kingdom has three. So their income was two. He gives them three. This guy will do the same thing. One, two, and he will... He'll go into Dwarven Falls, and he will work the mine, and the dwarves get another dollar. So there you go. So the dwarves now have four dollars. The dwarves are going to build another Iron Legion. He costs an additional four, so that's all of their money. They're going to build him here in the Shaded Vale. Now, uh, when you build, not, not at the beginning of the game, but when you build at any other time, uh, if you build in a settlement that you control, so in Shaded Vale or in Zarenbar, um, your unit comes in ready. So remember we said you tilt them if they're finished, they come in ready. And so, so I can build them here and then he can go hailing off and do whatever he wants to do. If I build him here next to, because you can remember you can build next to a settlement, he comes into play finished. So you can build adjacent to a settlement, but you won't be able to do anything that turn. So... You, you know, that's something to consider. So, obviously, I'm going to build him in here because I don't want him to be finished. I want to do something with him. And then I'm going to move him. I could move, I could do something else. And I will. Let's just do it just to show you how it works. So you build somebody, he's ready, but you don't have to do anything with him uh, right now or at any point. I'm going to do something with the Iron Legion. The Iron Legion is not going to move. He wants to hold Zarnbar, so these guys can't take it. But he's going to attack the Sea Reavers. So, uh, that's an action. That's the main action up here. Uh, attack an adjacent hostile settlement or unit. First of all, you look and see if there's any abilities here. There aren't any that would influence that combat. So, it's going to be... You collect the dice for each side. The Iron Legion has two heavies, one light. The Sea Reavers have the opposite. Two light, one heavy. Um, if there's terrain, it'll affect it. So, if this Sea Reaver were up here in the mountains... The mountains give you an extra dice, so he would have one more dice on defense. Uh, if he was behind a river, so if he was attacking over a river, uh, a major river gives you two additional dice. Uh, a minor river like this would give you one. Uh, but up here in the open, um, there's no additional dice for that, so it's going to be a straight fight. So we just roll these, and remember we're looking for fives and sixes. So we'll start with the Iron Legion. Ah, he's got a, a six and an eight, so two successes, and the sea reaver, which I'm, this eight I'm going to talk about in a minute, and then the sea reavers uh, have an eight and two threes, so let's just pull out all the failures, so those threes fail, that guy fails, uh, That these are two successes, and this is one success. All right, there's something called a critical hit. During combat, if your unit rolls a 7 or 8 on a dice. So obviously you can't roll it on a light dice. You can only roll it on a heavy dice. If you roll a 7 or an 8, that's called a critical hit. And what it lets you do is for each critical hit that you roll, you get to roll an extra dice to try to confirm it. And if you do, 
that'll be an extra hit that you'll inflict, or an extra success. So let's try the, the Iron Legion. I'm going to try to confirm that critical hit. It's a five. A five is a success, so that confirms. That's an additional hit. These guys, also a five. They confirm their critical hit. So uh, instead of doing two hits to one hit, there's three hits to two hits. Uh, the way, that, way, way combat works is each hit that an opponent does negates one of, one of the opposing uh, guys' hits. So one, one, those, those guys uh, negate each other, these negate each other, leaving one hit that the Iron Legion did to the Sea Reavers. And when that happens, this guy flips over to his weakened side. Um, if, if he had taken two, if the, if the, if, uh, the Iron Legion had done two hits, one would flip him, the other would eliminate him, and that would be the end of the game, end of the battle. That would allow this guy to advance into that hex if he wants to. Uh, but because he only did one hit, the Sea Reavers take, take the hit, and then he will be finished. Um, so if we look at the, at the Oathborn, they have one guy left. They don't have any gold left. They can't build anybody else. So this guy is going to activate. He's going to go, he's going to follow this road, road to get the extra movement point. So one, two, three. Um, you can go through, remember I said you can't stack, but you can go through a hex with another guy. You just can't end there. So he's going to come up to here, and he's going to attack Fort Garad. So we said that Fort Garad is neutral and hostile to both sides, um, and you can attack a hostile settlement with your attack action. So uh, the Iron Legion is going to attack Fort Garad with its attack action. Uh, so he's going to have two heavies and a light, like we described. Uh, uh, settlements that are um, that are unoccupied defend with one white dice. Cities, which have this red star, this isn't in the game, this guy can't be attacked, but if he could in the, in the regular game, they have a red star, they, they defend with three dice, and they use it even if they're, even if they're um, occupied by an army. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, if there was an army here, there would be no def no defensive. It's called a garrison. Um, but because there's nobody there, the gar that you get one garrison dice to defend. All right, I'm going to talk about these right now. So if you look at, I don't think I don't know if you can see it up there, but if you look at settlements, I'm look on the terrain chart here. Uh, if you look at settlements on the map, they have. Uh, Things just like uh, just like the abilities on units, they have uh, icons that tell you certain things. So this shows you that it's a city. That's a red star, like I described. It has a different kind of garrison than a regular settlement. Uh, a port has that little anchor uh, and lets you do ship movement and other things. Fortified is this tower. Well, Fort Garad is a fort, and it has two symbols. It has the port, and it has so you, uh, you can't really see it. There's a, it has the port, and it has the fort. The port doesn't really affect anything right now. Um, however, the fort is a big deal. The fort means that when you attack this fort, you have a minus one to hit. Minus one, so all your dice that you roll are whatever they show, there's one, they're, one, they're worth one less. So if, it, if you roll a six, it's worth a five. If you roll a five, it, it becomes a four. And remember, a four or less is a failure. So if you're attacking Fort Garad with this fortification symbol, uh, you need a six to hit because a six minus one is five. That's a success, but anything else you roll is going to be a failure. So let's roll the attack. So the Iron Legion storms in with its heavy dice. There's a six. That goes down to a five. Five is a success. Here's a five. It goes down to a four. That's a failure. And this three obviously is a failure anyway. And let's see what Fort Garad rolls. They rolled a 1. That's a failure in any case. So, uh, even with the difficulty of storming the walls, the Iron Legion is able to get in with its roll of a 6. Uh, one hit against a uh, settlement, an unoccupied settlement, uh, defeats it. So the Iron Legion goes in. Um, when you go into a hostile settlement, you loot it. That's the first thing. Uh, it's not an action, it's, a free, it's called a free action. <clears throat> you get two dollars just for plundering that town, and then he's finished because his attack action was his action. 
Um, and the other thing you do for free action is you put a control marker in the town that you take. So they gained a control marker that increases their income by one. If this had been controlled by Fjordland, um, they would have taken away their control marker and they would have lost a dollar from their income, lost one from their income. So the, uh, the, um, the Oathborn get $2, which they can now spend if they want, or they can hang on to it. Um, they don't really want to build any more miners right now. Well, here's something I can talk about. Actually, I wouldn't mind putting a miner here. However, if an enemy army is adjacent to your settlement, that settlement is besieged. And what that means is you can't build in it. A port, which we talked about earlier, has a slight advantage. It requires two, two guys, two armies, to besiege a port. So if one guy is next to a port, you can still build there. Two guys, now you can't. Um, that's because it's easy. You can get boats in and out of ports. Um, they're a little more um, more difficult to lay siege to, so you need, you need two armies to do that. Um, so they're going to save their $2. They're not going to build a guy there. Um, they're going to uh, bank on the Iron Legion to defend it. I don't think anyone can get down here in one turn. So the Oathborn have finished their turn. And that gets moved to the turn complete space. Let's go through the Fjordland turn. So we begin with Fjordland's income step. They get $4. Four. So they have to hold more settlements than the Oathborn. If they're the same number of settlements, the Oathborn wins. So right now, they control three. The Oathborn control three. One, two. The Sea River's moved two. Uh, he will now attack. He's got uh, three dice. Doing two hits, two fives. Um, the Iron Legion has two heavies and a light. He does one hit. Uh-oh. So, two six, uh, this is a, two, a couple of twos. That's going to flip him. So, all right. Um, we will send another one. We'll send this guy in the Sea Reavers. Um, and he will attack with the same thing. Doing one hit. One success. Let's put it that way. Uh, one success, but it's a seven. That's a critical hit, so let's see if it confirms. It does not confirm with a four. So, these are the same. They tie. If you look here in this abilities and characteristics summary, ranged, a stack. A stack in the basic game just means one guy, because you can't put more than one guy in a hex. But in the advanced game, you can have a hero in a hex with a guy, so that becomes a stack, it's called. So an army, essentially, containing a unit with ranged, which is what this symbol means, wins ties when resolving combat, inflicting one hit on the opponent. So uh, if what we, did, what we did here was a tie. We rolled the same number of successes, that's a tie. Ordinarily, there's no winner in that case. Um, but be, if, uh, if the ranger had been involved, because the ranger has ranged, uh, that tie would have resulted in him winning and the Oathborn guy would have taken a hit, even though it was a tie. But the Sea Reavers don't have any ability. They don't have ranged. So the Iron Legion holds them off. Now, the Sea, Re sea Reavers could attack, but he's weakened. Uh, the symbology on this is different. That's just because it's an old version. So they're both weakened. So it's a bit of a gamble. Do you want to do it or not? He's got $4. He could build a guy. Maybe he'll do that. So he's going to build his last Sea Reaver. Here, for $3. One, two, three. $3, his last Sea Reaver. Begins in Far to Med. Uh, and as you remember, if you build in a settlement, you um, enter play ready, and then he will move out. One, two, and he will attack the Iron Legion there. Here's his attack. Two lights and a heavy. He gets two successes. Oh, that's tough. The Iron Legion. Now, 
remember, a settlement gets one dice on defense if it's a garrison, but if it's occupied, they don't get that dice, so he doesn't get any benefit. So, aha, uh -huh. he rolls two as well, and one's a critical. So let's see if that critical is confirmed. No, it's not. So, he's finished, and the Iron Legion managed to hold off all those guys. We have one more dude who could attack the Sea Weavers. Um, he will. Why not? In for penny, in for pound. So here you go. He's going to attack with his... He gets one hit. Uh-oh. Better be careful. Iron Legion surges out of town, swinging with axes, and does one hit, but it's a critical. Oh, uh, he survives. So that, that was not a success. So the critical was not confirmed. Yet another tie. And no hits. Now, let's just say both sides rolled no successes. That's a draw. And a ranged a combat does not help in a draw if, if no successes are rolled. It only works if b both players roll the same number of successes. Minimum of one. One, two, three to far too med. Just to hold it. I don't know. I don't think there's anybody going to come after it. Barless, I'm a little worried about. Okay, we're gonna try. Uh, uh, this will give me an opportunity to show you a couple different things. All right, uh, Rangers. Rangers also have a special rule, which is on their play mat. They have woodcraft. They have woodcraft, which is the same as mountaineering, which means they can go through forests without paying any extra movement, just like the dwarves can move through mountains without paying any extra. So he's gonna go one, two, three. He's gonna go there. If you look, there's some coastline in that hex. That makes that a coastal hex, it's called. Um, coastal hexes are all these hexes all around here, all around here, all around here. Those are all coastal hexes. They have that coastal uh, coastline symbol in the hex, uh, even a little bit. So that's a coastal hex there. Um, this little thing here, that little lake, there's a coastal hexes there. Those are all considered coastal hexes. So he's in a coastal hex. So, uh, under actions, there's something here called Perform Ship Movement. Use ship movement to cross sea and coastal hex sides or enter major river hexes. Okay, so his action will be, he can't attack, he can't do anything like that, but his action will be to make a ship move. So, you have to start in a coastal hex or in a major river hex like this, and then your action is you get to move. If you start in a port, if you, if you do, like this is a port, Mangoot's a port. Let's say you're in a port, he's in a port, and he declares, I'm going to do my ship move now. A ship move, when you start in a port, gives you six movement points. You can go one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, you can only cross sea hex sides, these sea hexes. Uh, coastal hex side is one that's divided by this. So this is actually considered a sea hex side. You can't ordinarily cross that hex side except by ship movement. Um, so you can move six if you start in a port. And you have to end in a coastal hex or in a major river hex. So he could go, he go up this river, he'd go one, two, three, four, five, six, like that. Um, if you start in any other kind of hex, you only get three movement points. So he's in a coastal hex. He's gonna get on his boat and go across Lake Fosfonet. So one, two. And he's gonna protect that from these miners who it's kind of scary that they're right there. So that ends his move. So he moved, and then his action was ship move. Um, so everybody's done. I have one dollar left, which I'm going to bank, and that's going to end the season. So the spring is over. We advance to the summer. These both of these markers go back up to the ready uh, ready thing, um, and we continue right along. The Oath will now have an income of three. So here's their three dollars. And they saved two dollars. Pretty good. Um, all their guys become ready. So they were finished, but now they're ready. Let's, um, let's hamper 
the Fjordland's ability to build by laying siege to Barlas on the lake. I kind of like that idea. So, what that means is I'm going to take my miner and he's going to go to here. He's not going to attack. He only has one one light attack dice. The rangers have two and they, they win on ties because they have range. So he's just going to stay there and lay siege. Then we will spend one gold to build a miner here in Shaded Vale and go one, two. Oh, we can't. <laughs> That was me. That was me making a miscalculation. I thought I could mine in the same turn. One, two. Well, he can only get to there, so he can't actually get into the endless paths yet. So he's got to wait there. Um, so, all right, that's okay. Um, this guy will mine. He's going to mine the guy in the Dwarven Falls. He's going to mine Dwarven Falls to get a dollar. That gives me five. That gives me enough for a Dragon Slayer if I want it. I do, but I'm not going to build them yet because I want to build them in. Fort Garad. So the guy in Fort Garad is, needs to vacate so I can build there. He can move two, he can move three by road. He's going to go one, two, and he's going to attack these sea reavers. Here we go. He's attacking the sea reavers. He gets one critical. The sea reavers miss. So let's see if he confirms a critical. No. So he just does one hit to the sea reavers, and then he's done. Now, now that's empty, so I can build there, and I'm going to build for five dollars. Ooh, 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 I'm building the dragon slayers. Now the dragon slayers are going to—they move three. They have um, two heavy dice, and here's they have this ability, which is called stealth. Um, stealth lets them. Uh, conduct combat a little differently, and I'll show you how that works. So they're going to go one, two, and they're going to attack these weakened sea reavers here with their two dice. So they have two dice, two heavies, and the sea reavers have uh, their usual three dice, two lights and one heavy. However, if one side has stealth, which he does, and the other side doesn't have stealth, which they don't, the dragon slayers can ambush the sea reavers. And they say, okay, we're not going to conduct this combat like a regular combat. We're going to have an ambush combat. And what that means is you don't roll simultaneously. The ambushing side rolls first, inflicts its hits, and then only if he survives does he do the same thing back. Um, so, powerful. Uh, it can only do one hit, except for criticals. Criticals will do more. But even if I roll like, so in an ambush, if I roll two sevens, I will do a maximum of one hit. So two successes still only leaves one hit. However, like let's say I rolled two sevens, both criticals, um, I could try to confirm both of those. And let's say I rolled this, a five and a three. This five confirms. I would do one for these. That's the regular hits because you can only ever do one. And then an additional one for the confirmed critical hit. So it would be two hits. But that's the only way that you can do two hits with a, uh, an ambush. Mostly an ambush will only do one hit. Um, if this guy survives, he hits back, and the same rules apply. So, Dragon Flayers are going to declare an ambush. They're rolling two dice. Oh, and they whiffed. A three and a one, they missed. Okay, so, Sea Reavers survive, and they try to cut their way out of the ambush. Dragon Slayers overextended themselves, and they also roll no successes. That ambush was a failure. So the dwarves, do they have anything left? No, they're all out of money. Everybody's done. Turns over. So you can see these turns can go pretty quick once you get the... Uh, well, this guy could do something, but he's not. He's going to try to hold. All right, so, we're, so it's Fjordland's turn. So Fjordland, all their units become ready. And they get their income, which is $4. One, two, three, four. Uh, thank you. All right, the rangers up here. Uh, this is the edge of the map. Uh, this line, I mean, you can't really see it, but there's a line right here. Um, so when you're just playing this one map, you can't go into these mountains. You, you can go right along here. That's the map edge. So these rangers are going to go one, two, three, four. 
and they're going to attack these miners, and they're occupying the endless paths, so now the, if the miners have to get them out of there to kill them to get them out of there. So, the rangers have two light dice. The miners have one, but they get one more for the mountains. If you're defending in the mountains, you get an, anybody gets an extra dice. So it's two on two, but the rangers have ranged abilities, so they can um, win ties. So if they roll the same number of hits, the rangers will win. Uh, rangers do one hit. The miners do two hits. So the miners do one and one and uh, uh, one more than the rangers. So they do a hit to the to the rangers. Rangers are pissed off about that because they cost four times as much as a miner. So ridiculous. Um, the Fjordlanders are going to go one, two, three, and then C move bloop, to Barless. Now, for four dollars, we can build another ranger. Take him off the playmat, and he's going to go into Far Tumed here. And he can move four, so he's going to go one, two, three, four. You can go right around people. There's no, like, there's no problem with moving around an enemy army. You can zip right around them. Okay, he's going to attack Far Tumed. Well, remember, Far Tumed's unoccupied. Gets one dice, but it's fortified. So the Rangers have minus one on all of their dice. And they only have two light, two light dice. But they win ties. So if they do even one hit, they will win. So let's see. No, they don't roll anything. And... Fort Garad oh, rolls a hit and reduces the Rangers. Uh, we have a couple of weakened units here. Uh, I'll show you how this works. So the Sea Reavers can move. He can stay where he is, but he's going to move into here. And then he's going to use his action to recover. So let's look at the actions again. Here's another action. Recover. Pay the active unit's recovery cost to return it to full strength. It must be in or adjacent to an unbesieged, welcoming settlement. Well, this settlement's unbesieged, and it's welcoming. However, we only have one dollar. <laughs> so we can't actually heal him up, because he caused, costed two to, to heal him up. So we can't recover. He's just going to go there and just garrison it. He's just going to hold it. This guy is going to attack again. Let's see if we can break in here. So he's got his usual. The attack continues. Oh, he whiffed. And the Iron Legion. Oh, we brutalized them. Two hits. One's a critical. But two is all you need. So one hit flips him. The other hit destroys him. Oh, this is the Siege of Car uh, Zarenbar. The stout dwarves. Doughty dwarves. Okay. Uh, sea Reavers say, hell with that. We're going to do that. He's going to move to here. And he's going to do it again. They're climbing the walls. Two hits. One's a critical. Oh, three hits. Well, it may, the dwarves may have met their match. Uh, so they're going to need <laughs> they're going to need three hits, and they're rolling three dice. There's two, so that's going to counter two of them, and then the, the that's an eight, so that's a critical. This is it. If five or a six, he'll survive. Oh, he did not survive. So, he's eliminated. Um, when uh, the enemy is eliminated, you're allowed to advance into their hex. So you do. See what do. They loot. Two dollars for them. Ah. Oh, too bad. We already, we already, he's already done. He can't use his action now. This guy can't. Uh, and then you put your control marker in here. So, we removed one, we removed the... That counts as a control marker, essentially. Uh, Zarnbar, it's a loyal settlement, it's called. If it has it marked on the map, that's a loyal settlement. He lost a loyal settlement. That l loses him one income. We put down a control marker. That gains us one income. So they go up to five now. Um, so that was big. Um, and so we have three left. So I can spend two. So I, he's going to move to here. No. He's going to go up into the mountains, and then he's going to use his action to recover. He has to be in or adjacent to a friendly settlement. This is now friendly. Welcoming. I'm sorry, welcoming. And it costs him $2 to flip back to full strength. So $2. Uh, there you go. $2. That leaves us with one in the bank. Uh, everything's nicely garrisoned up, and Fjordland um, finishes its turn. 
uh, feeling a little better about things than it was uh, at the beginning. So summer ends and we're on to the autumn. Now, the campaign ends marker is in the autumn space. That means that at the end of the season, um, we're going to check victory and the game will be over. So let's get our income. Our income is now down to two because we lost Zarenbar. So two dollars for the Oathborn. Uh, we could get more if we mine. I think we'll keep that in mind. We can't mine here until we kill that ranger. We can mine here. So that'll give us potentially three dollars. Three dollars is enough for a king's crossbowman. Here, I'll show you them. King's crossbowmen are cool. Uh, this is a dwarf ranged unit. Like the rangers have ranged, so did the king's crossbows. He's He fires a heavy and a light dice. Still moves two, obviously. But he's got ranged, which is pretty cool. So they're they're tough uh, tough little defenders because uh, they win ties. Um, so if I mine, I'll have enough money to buy one of those. So I'll just go ahead and do that now. Bloop. So he mines. He doesn't move, just mines. And that gives me a dollar. A gold. We're going to start to see. Just this is our this is our big gambit. The dragon slayers are going to move up and attack. Actually, attack from here. That way, they can put that into siege and attack that. Far too mad. If they can hit this guy, that'll be game. Well, not game. They'll take him out. All right. So dragon slayers, as you recall, they have stealth. So they're going to sneak up on far too mad, and they're going to ambush these sea reavers. Um, so the, they were going to roll their two dice prior to the Sea Reavers doing anything. The Sea Reavers are reduced, so if the Dragon Slayers inflict a hit, uh, that's it for them. <laughs> oh, oh, they did it! A two and a one! So, since they failed, the Sea Reavers are going to counterattack. The Dragon Slayers boldly came into town. Oh! Three hits! But you remember what we said. Three hits doesn't matter in an ambush, the maximum you can do is one. However, there's a critical right there. Three successes, you still only do one hit, but if this confirms, you do two. Oh, very close. Almost. So they simply do one hit to the Dragon Slayers in return. Wow, that was, uh, that was unexpected. I thought twice they whiffed the Dragon Slayers. So what's the right move here? We could loot this if we take it. So we're going to one, two. Iron Legion going in. Two and one. Come on. Come on, Iron Legion. Uh, there we go. Three successes. Take that, Sea Reavers. The Sea Reavers fight with their normal two lights and a heavy. And do one. But one to three. Takes two hits. Insufficient. Far too med falls to the Iron Legion. Uh, and they are allowed to advance in. Uh, they remove this control marker, which reduces Fjordland to four. They put their own marker in, which increases their income to f back to three. And they loot two dollars. So there we go. That solved our money problem. So these guys are both done. Miners are done, but we have five dollars. Five dollars on. We're going to spend. Three of that on a king's crossbow here in Fort Garod. So that's three dollars. So ranged, these guys both have ranged. So when you have two units that have the same ability, they cancel out. So like if we had two ambush, two guys with stealth, you couldn't do an ambush. Uh, that would just be normal combat. You, these guys could build a guy here and then go over here and attack Norstead. But because you're building adjacent, they come and finish. So you could build here, but you can't attack until next turn, and that's end of the game. So you can't, like, leapfrog ahead. You can't capture a city, then build guys and keep attacking forward. Here I could move out and then build another guy. I have two two left. That's basically just two miners. The the dwarves don't have anybody who... The Oathborn don't have anybody who is a two-cost. Um, all right, so we're going to, for, for one dollar, we're going to build a miner in the Shaded Veil, just in case those rangers try anything tricky. Buy the King's Crossbows here. Uh, that cost me a dollar for the miner. 
And we can build another miner just to uh, futz with people. Put, put, we'll build a miner here just so the Sea Reaver can't quite get at me. So there, and he, because he comes in, he's built adjacent, he's finished. So everybody's done. I mean, these guys could move and do stuff, but I don't want to. I'm gonna, they're gonna sit quietly. Um, so the Oathborn are done. This, that. War. So, okay, these, we go to the Fjordland turn. Fjordland is, uh, uh, become ready, and they've got to take a settlement, one settlement. If they can do that, they're going to win. If they can't, they're going to lose. So, so it's going to be hard for me to get my Sea Reavers down here, which, of course, was the point. That's why I put them there. The Rangers could get down there. One, two, three, four, could plus two to cross the river. Um... Tough. It's going to be tough for him to do two hit. Well, we'll give it a shot. All right, we're going to do that. Hell with it. Rangers are attacking the miners in the Shaded Vale. So two dice. The miners get one dice. Uh, they're not attacking across a river or anything. There's no terrain involved. So just two on one, but the rangers have, have uh, ranged ability, so they win ties. So here are the rangers. They missed. Three and a two. And the, the miners did nothing. Uh, this ranger will go one, two. Uh, this is not, this river, ha this is the river hex here. This river is not uh, protecting Shaded Vale. He's going to attack here. There's two. Two hits! Well, he could do it. He could do it if this is not a hit. Oh, the doughty dwarves! So it's two to one. He takes one hit and holds Shaded Veil. Uh, this guy can't get in because it's cost him two to get here. He only has a movement rating of two, so one, two, he's done. Um, that means for these guys to win, what was their income? Uh, I forgot to collect their income, it's four. Four, and they had one saved, they have five. So they could get it, they could build guys out of Norstead and come attack into uh, I guess we're going to do that. We're going to build a Sea Reaver here. He's going to come in. He's going to attack. And we, we know the drill. Sea Reaver has two light and heavy. One hit. The Iron Legion. Two hits. And one's a critical. Just two hits. Enough to pound that Sea Reaver. And he's finished. Um, well, it's looking a little grim. All right, these guys are going to come over. Same deal. Two. You never know. There's two hits. If these guys whiff entirely, they can take it. They do not whiff entirely. They do two. One is a critical. Uh, it's, so it ends up being a tie. They did not confirm the critical. So two hits to two hits is a tie. Can't build here because the Dragon Slayers have it under siege. I think the best we can do best we can do. We shot our bolt. The best we can do is build, for the, our last two points, build a freeholder <laughs> in uh, Norstead, and he can go one, two, three. He's going to attack. Uh, this is what you call a long shot. He has two light dice versus two heavy and a light. So, come on, freeholders. They do no hits. And the Iron Legion does one, which flips him. He's finished. The Fjordland is out of money. They're basically out of units. This guy could go to here, could go to here, but he can't even get in there. This guy could go one, two, one, two. Well, you go one, two, no, one, two. Then he so there's no way for him to get up here and attack. So you can see what happens is these guys attack, but then they fill up those hexes. So you can't send in another wave like. Like, even if we had the ability to build more, we couldn't even get them in because these guys are all fighting there. So I think this we have this and we have this, and I don't think either of them can get anywhere to affect anything. So I believe that at the, uh, that at the end of the autumn, which is the end of the campaign, Fjordlands turns over, 
Uh, they, they control three settlements. The Oathborn control three settlements. And if, the, if that's a tie, the Oathborn win. So there you go. That is the basic game for Burning Banners. Uh, like I said, there's lots of campaigns. Uh, you can play them all the way through up to the big games. And the big games are completely playable with using the basic rules. The basic rules are a lot of fun. Um, I'm going to do another video uh, talking about the advanced rules. Um, just basically so after you're done watching this, if you're interested in going on to the advanced rules, that'll be the next video. So uh, thank you very much for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.